Greetings world. We are Anonymous. This following video focuses on the Federal Reserve problem of the United States. If you live in another country please know that this video is still meant for you. The problem will affect everybody around the world as the Federal Reserve is present in all countries. Watch this video and see what has happened to the United States so you can see what you and the world are up against. We must all unite together to fight our oppressors. Please pay attention. Every human on this planet is enslaved, whether they know it or not. This is not the crude and primitive slavery of ancient times. It does not rely on whips and shackles to keep the oppressed in their place. These tools have been rendered obsolete by much more sophisticated methods. That most of the enslaved are unaware of their condition and would in fact argue fiercely that they are free is a testament to the effectiveness of these invisible chains. You've heard the expression, money makes the world go round. There's truth in that. Money is the prime motive for human labor in modern civilization. If you want food, shelter, and clothing, you must have money. And unless you're part of that tiny minority that has more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime, then you must work, beg, or steal for that money. That's why you get up in the morning and go to work, even if you hate your job. And that's why the specter of unemployment is more terrifying for most people than the prospect of spending 50 years of their life performing menial tasks within the confines of a fluorescent lit cubicle. Of course, in Western countries, some are fortunate enough to have pulled away from the brink and do not live in fear that their basic needs will be met, at least for now. And yet they keep spinning the hamster wheel. Why is that? Could it be because money and the bling that it buys have become symbols of status and prestige? Money offers an illusory form of social validation, but even those who are not caught up in distinguishing themselves by how much they accumulate still must acknowledge the social stigma that comes with poverty. The combination of these primal motivators, the need for food, shelter, clothing, and social validation, is a very powerful force. It's enough to drive humans to engage in all forms of activity, even to the point of harming themselves or others in the process. The accumulation of money is therefore an accumulation of social and psychological power, and those who control the creation of money control this power at its source. So who controls the creation of money? Well, in the case of the U.S. dollar, it's not the government. This shouldn't be an earth-shattering revelation. The fact that the Federal Reserve is a private institution owned by a cartel of the world's most powerful banks is quickly becoming common knowledge. Even the mainstream media doesn't deny it at this point. However, the full extent of what this means is only clear when you understand how the banking system really works. And unfortunately, this isn't something we're taught in school. Once you have it explained to you in simple terms, you'll understand why. Every dollar in circulation is loaned into existence by a bank. The process begins with the Federal Reserve when they loan out money to the U.S. government and to other entities. You've probably heard this talked about before, especially in regards to the interest rate on those loans, which the Federal Reserve raises and lowers depending on economic conditions. But what's never talked about in the mainstream is the fact that the Fed isn't actually loaning out money that they have. They are merely typing those dollars into existence on a computer. You may be inclined to believe that this money is based on some physical backing like gold, but you'd be mistaken. The Federal Reserve hasn't owned any gold since the 1930s. We don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. When the Federal Reserve loans money to the U.S. government, the U.S. government gives the Federal Reserve government bonds in exchange. These bonds are simply written promises to pay back the money that was loaned to them with interest through taxation. So to be clear here, the government is taking out a loan from a bank that is creating that money out of thin air, and they're expecting you, the taxpayer, to cover that loan. The absurdity of this arrangement is even more obvious when you realize that up until 1913, the U.S. government created its own money and had no need for a bank to play the part of a middleman. That new money loaned out by the Federal Reserve enters circulation through the banks, accumulates in the banks, and in the end, the banks end up holding all the cards. But not necessarily for the reasons you may imagine. Contrary to popular belief, the majority of money in circulation isn't actually created by the Federal Reserve, but rather by the ordinary banks that businesses and individuals use for their checking, savings, and mortgages. How is this possible? Well, like the Federal Reserve, ordinary banks are allowed to loan out money that they don't have. 
there are of course restrictions. Banks are only allowed to loan out 10 times the amount of money that they actually have. So if Wells Fargo has $1,000, they can loan you $10,000 and they expect you to pay back that $10,000 plus interest. This is called fractional reserve banking. 75% of all money in circulation is created in this manner. Now as bad as this may seem, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Most banks structure payment plans so that for many years, you're paying almost nothing but interest and only start paying down the principal gradually. The result of this strategy is that in most cases, you pay far more in interest when you purchase a house than the house itself is worth. So here's the real question. If all money is created through loans, where does the money come from to pay for the interest? Let's say we reset the system to zero, loan $1,000 into existence and charge 7% interest. We now have a total of $1,000 in the system, but we owe $1,000 plus interest, and that's more. The interest ensures that there's always more debt than money in circulation, because the money to pay the interest doesn't exist, never has, never will. This would be obvious if there was only one loan being issued to one person in this manner, but when performed on a global scale, the reality is hidden and is transformed into a game of musical chairs where the person ending up without a seat faces bankruptcy and financial ruin. Because every dollar in existence is tied to a debt, this creates an unseen force that draws those dollars back to the banks, kind of like gravity attracts a physical object to Earth. The catch here is that it's the labor of the people that moves that money. Every hour that you work to pay back a loan or to keep the government from throwing you in jail over income taxes is an hour worked for the banks. The total receipts from personal income taxes just barely covers the interest on the national debt. And even the principal for that debt all ends up back in the hands of the banks. And remember, that bank created that money out of nothing. Once you understand that the money that banks loan out isn't actually an asset, but is in fact a piece of legal fiction, it should be clear that you're working for these banks for free. This is a cleverly disguised form of slavery. If you manage to pay your monthly payments, then you are a successful slave, and you are allowed to keep the material comforts that come with that status. But if for some reason you fail to make those monthly payments, then the bank or the IRS comes to take your house, your car, and anything else you have of value. And if somehow, even with this enormous financial advantage, the banks still get themselves into trouble, you, the taxpayer, will be forced to bail them out. No matter what, the banks win. To say the game is rigged is an understatement. You might be inclined to think that if you live outside the United States and you don't use dollars, then this situation has no bearing on your life. But you would be wrong. The dollar is both the world reserve currency and the only currency in which oil is sold on global markets. This is often referred to as the petrodollar status. This means that wherever you live, whether your country is an oil exporter or an oil importer, you are affected. If your country is an oil importer, then you are affected by the fact that in order to keep your country running, you have to acquire dollars. To acquire those dollars, you have to send goods and services to the United States or to someone else who did. Likewise, if your country is an oil exporter, you are affected by the fact that you send your oil to the U.S. in exchange for this debt-based money. You are exchanging something of real and tangible value for digits on a screen. And if for some reason the leadership of your country grows tired of this arrangement and tries to pull off the dollar, you'll quickly find the United States military at your doorstep ready to open up a can of democracy on you. Iraq learned this the hard way when they switched their oil sales to euros in 2000, and Libya when they tried to organize a gold-based currency for Africa. Debt-based money is a masterpiece of social engineering, the ultimate tool of the ruling elite. Yet in reality, the whole thing is nothing more than a construct of belief. Our chains are the chains of the mind. And the path to freedom must also begin in the mind. If we want a better future for our children and grandchildren, then we must work right now to reach a critical mass of awakening. So in case you missed it.
the Federal Reserve's only job was to issue paper currency and back up that money with gold, making each dollar refundable for gold. But what they did was they stole the gold, then printed a bunch of fake money out of thin air backed by nothing and loaned it out at high interest. They collected around $3 for every one fake dollar they produced, and they did this scam with every dollar ever made in the U.S. You never knew about it because they collected the interest through taxes. It was an invisible scam. This scam put you and your children in a $19 trillion debt, making your children debt slaves forever. The following video will demonstrate how much these banksters stole from the world. We are considered the 99% in the video. They, the banksters, are considered the 1% in the video. Pay attention. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution, and 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor, since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. 
Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2-5% to are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976 they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This of course set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil-producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in U.S. dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the U.S. had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, 
it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher, outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually US military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the U.S. invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Worth it. Ms. Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. of the mainstream media began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15 to 20 percent loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. So now you can see we really did go to war just to keep this Federal Reserve petrodollar scandal going. And if you think our country didn't commit 9-11 to go to war, do a little research on Operation Northwoods. It was a plan to fly multiple planes into real towers with real people, to go to war with Cuba. Congress signed off to do this act of terrorism. All branches of military did as well. The government kills for the banks. Our country is ran by the banksters. Preserve our independence. We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our choice between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. I place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the very continent their fathers conquered. The Federal Reserve made so much profit from this money scandal they were able to literally control the government. They meet every year with politicians presidents and many corporate giants where they control everything behind closed doors. These people control everything. This meeting is called Bilderberg Group. The Federal Reserve bankers are what are commonly referred to as the Illuminati. This is not a conspiracy. 
past presidents have warned you many times this is not a conspiracy. We are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. What's happening? Where am I? I believe perhaps you understand now, Bob, but you are afraid. JFK, Hartman, what does this have to do with my house and my dog? Oh, okay, that's enough. I, I want to go home now. This is the last president to stand up to the Fed. You must see. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110. This executive order empowered the U.S. Treasury to issue real money without the Fed. It would have worked. Kennedy's plan to dismantle the Federal Reserve machine had begun. Six months later, John F. Kennedy went to Dallas and never returned. No way. No way they could do that. The new president. Lyndon Johnson threw out Kennedy's order. And since JFK, no president has dared confront the secret powers behind the Federal Reserve. Just how rich and powerful is Lord Evelyn Rothschild? Historically, the Rothschild family wealth was hidden in underground vaults. The Rothschild's secret financial records were never audited and never accounted for. Their family commissioned biographies give the illusion that their family fortune has dwindled. But researchers estimate their wealth at close to $500 trillion, more than half the wealth of the entire world. Besides their many castles, palace mansions, wineries, racehorses, and exotic resorts, the Rothschilds bought Reuters in the 1800s. Reuters then bought the Associated Press, which selects and delivers the same news stories to the entire world, day after day. They have controlling interest in three major television networks and easily avoid media attention since they own it. They also fix the world price of gold on a daily basis and profit from its ups and downs. Over the centuries, the Rothschilds have amassed trillions of dollars worth of gold bullion in their subterranean vaults and have cornered the world's gold supply. They own controlling interest in the world's largest oil company, Royal Dutch Shell. They operate phony charities and offshore banking services where the wealth of the black nobility and the Vatican is hidden in secret accounts at Rothschild Swiss banks, trusts, and holding companies. Although Evelyn Rothschild looks like a harmless gray-haired old man, make no mistake about it, Rothschild and his ancestors have hand-picked presidents, crashed stock markets, bankrupted nations, orchestrated wars, and sponsored the mass murder and impoverishment of millions.
and breaking news. To all of you who don't like conspiracy theorists, all of y'all who don't like truthers, who want to call truthers crazy, your fun is over. Those days of you having the illusion of credibility are over. The truth prevails over your ignorance. The truth is universal. You can try to say, oh, truthers are white supremacists. How does that work? Uh-huh. Whatever you want to say. You've been demonizing 9-11 truthers all these years. You're demonizing Sandy Hook truthers. Well, if it was a real conspiracy, don't you think the media would talk about it? Don't you think it would be on the front page of the news? Don't you think? Well, if it was a real government conspiracy, why do you think they would let that be on the news? Because you know the news stations are bought off, bought and paid for. You know the news, they read off a script, right? You know the news reporters do that, right? No? No, you don't know that? No, I trust my news. They are more credible than you. You are just some truther. I watch the news and I get informed. You get informed, don't you? Those reporters, they give you exclusive information. Now, you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. Well, if you filled up your gas tank lately, then you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. And you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. Well, you don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. Well, you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. I know. President, earlier this year you told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases, which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these, um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling, to that Justice Department opinion. This has been a long-standing practice of the federal government to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The Agricultural Department, as I understand, has been using these videos for a long period of time. The Defense Department, other departments have been doing so. It's important that, the, that they be based upon the guidelines set out by uh, the Justice Department. Now, I also I think it would be helpful if local stations then disclose to their viewers if that's, you know, that this was based upon a factual report and they chose to use it. But evidently in some cases that's not the case. So anyway. To guarantee that's happening by including that language in the prepackaged report. Yeah, I don't, you know, look, I mean, oh, you mean a disclosure on George W. Bush and I? Well, some way to make sure it couldn't air without the disclosure that you believe is so vital. Uh, you know, Ken, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a procedure that we're going to follow and the local stations ought to, if there's a deep concern about that, ought to tell their viewers what they're watching. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be able to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on his late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night TV. Conan O'Brien may be about to push the envelope on late night television.
But for these anchors to ask no questions, do no fact checking, and hold no differing interpretation of the news they're delivering is not only absurd, it's downright dangerous. And certainly the, there were commentators and, and others, pundits at Fox News that were helpful to the White did House. And did certainly, say, yes, certainly we got talking points say, to those call people. Call Sean, call a Bill, call whoever. Did you do certainly, that as a regular thing? I, I, it wasn't necessarily something I was doing, but it was something that we at the White House, yes, were doing and getting them talking points and making sure they knew where we were so coming from. So you were giving from. them talking points. But, but I would talking, separate no, the no, journalists. No, this is important. Yeah. You were using these commentators as your spokespeople. Well, certainly. I mean, certainly. I think that certainly. happens to both ways when people go on other networks as well that are, that are uh, favorable towards the Democrats and so Nobody's forth. Nobody's ever but. fed me any crap like that, so I don't know what you're talking <laughs> well, about. Well, you're, you're, you're an independent-minded guy. I, I, thank you. Yeah. But I'm, aren't you a little embarrassed by the fact that your White House used a, a television network which is purportedly fair and balanced well, as I, your mouthpiece? I think everybody in this town uses people that are going to be helpful to their cause to try to shape the narrative to their network? advantage. I, again, I would separate the journalists because the journalists that I work with uh, were people just like the rest of the White House press so corps who were trying to report the news. You wouldn't use Fred somebody to sell stuff for him, but you'd use the nighttime guys. Yeah, I, I would. I would separate that out, and certainly, uh, you know, and, and they'll say that that's because they agree with those views in the White House. Well, they didn't need a script, though, did they? Uh, well, probably not. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. In consumer news, economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times. See, in my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. Review time. I and I am so tired of this deception right here. This is what got you in a chokehold. The left versus the right. Left wing versus right wing. Don't you know the wings are of the same bird? A little corrupt bird, Republican versus Democrat. They got you cheering for teams. They got you in this tribalism mentality. You don't even understand it. They screwing you over. I'm going to show you how it works in this video. Now, you get here, John McCain over here talking about, oh, how the government shutdown was bad. Then you get people to agree with him and say, oh, John McCain is actually speaking some sense. He's right. It's the Republicans' fault. The Democrats love this little interview because, you know, it makes the Republicans look bad and gives them a reason to cheer for the blue team. Yeah, you're cheering for the blue team, but you're getting screwed over with this Obamacare. You're going to get McCain saying it was a bad idea to shut down the government because they wanted to repeal Obamacare. And what you're going to do, replace it with Romney care, the same thing. That's where Obamacare came from, Romney care. You see what I'm saying? Either way it go, we would have had the same type of health plan. Guess who else had the health plan? Hillary Clinton. You see these New World Order compliant 
candidates. They are backed by Wall Street. You don't have a real choice unless you go outside the Republicans and Democrats. This is how they keep screwing you over. Let's get into the video. Thank you, Martha. You know, I've heard a lot of veterans uh, so emotional uh, to the point of tears uh, I I over this issue. Uh, talk to me She's about so how fake. you think this has been handled by the White House. Oh, I think it's been terribly handled by the White House. But uh, let's have a little straight talk, uh, Martha. Straight talk. They wouldn't have had the opportunity to handle it that way if we had not shut down the government on a fool's errand. That's when the Democrats start cheering. Go ahead. Get your cheer on. That we were not going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole premise of shutting down the government was the repeal of Obamacare. Oh. I fought against Obamacare harder than any of the people who wanted to shut down the government. I bet you did. I, I campaigned all over this country in 2012 saying elect Mitt Romney and we'll repeal and replace Obamacare. But see, that's so dumb. Obamacare is the same thing as Romney care. See, it's all about getting you to cheer for the team. Check this out right here. Convinced that Republicans will win in November and we will regain our majorities in both the Senate and the House. Go ahead, Republicans. Start cheering. Why are you blinking like that? It's not blinking like that. What's your problem? And we will win House seats right here in Arizona. We will lead in Arizona. Uh-huh. Let's get to the point. Jeez, this uneventful speech. And when we do, we will stop the out-of-control spending and tax increases and repeal and replace Obamacare. Oh. And they're cheering. But repeal and replace Obamacare means they're going to put in Romney Care, which is the same doggone thing. Think I'm lying think I'm lying. We're going to look at this later. But let me see. Here we go. Uh, Governor Romney said uh, this has to be done on a bipartisan basis. This was a bipartisan idea. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was a Republican idea. Oh. And Governor Romney, at the beginning of this debate, wrote and said what we did in Massachusetts could be a model for the nation. And I agree that uh, the Democratic legislators in Massachusetts uh, might have given some advice to uh, Republicans in Congress about how to cooperate. Listen to him now. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we use the same advisors and they say it's the same plan. Wow. The same doggone plan. Let's look at this. There are some terrific Republican ideas. Uh, Mitt Romney in Massachusetts uh, has it's initiated mandatory insurance uh, mandatory. Uh, so that everybody has to buy in, uh, but then the government helps out those who can't afford it. Those kinds of bold initiatives, uh, I think the Democrats have to put forward bold as heck. if, in fact, we uh, can credibly came, uh, claim that we can run the country uh, and not simply uh, criticize on the sidelines. Now, this is key. This is in 2006. You see, he's, he's praising this individual mandate, too. It's funny he's doing that. So either way it go, we would have had this Obamacare, Romney care plan. But remember, I said Hillary ran on that plan as well. Obama didn't seem to like the individual mandate that's how he got elected. Well, one of the reasons that made him look good, because he said he wasn't for individual mandate. Let's check it out right here. Didn't represent her properly. They misrepresent her. Did they? And, and what do you say about that? Well, obviously, I think that they represented her position properly, which is, is that she supported in the past NAFTA, which has been pretty hard on Ohio. Uh, and we've had an ongoing Campaigning. discussion about health care. Both of us want to provide health care to all Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a slight difference, and her plan is a good one, but... Slight difference. Uh, this is the slight difference he's talking about. Check this out. She mandates uh, that everybody buy health care. She'd, she'd have the government force every individual to buy insurance. Which is what Obamacare is. And I don't have such a mandate because I don't think... The problem is that people don't want health insurance, it's that they can't... No, I don't want it. I, I don't want health insurance. ...afford it, so I focus more on lowering costs. And uh, th this is a modest difference, but it's one that she's tried to elevate, arguing that because I don't force people to buy health care, that I'm not insuring everybody. Well, if things were that easy, I could uh, mandate everybody buy a house, and, uh, that, you know, and that would solve uh, you know, the problem of homelessness. It, it, it doesn't. Uh-oh, watch out, y'all. He might do that next. So 
There you go. Obama with his lying self. Y'all need to stop with this. You're over here arguing, acting like you're against Obamacare, you Republicans. And they're talking about repeal and replace Obamacare with the same thing. What the heck is your problem? Get out of this tribalism mentality. And people who would say, oh, we need Hillary Clinton. Well, she down for the same plan. It's the same thing. It's the same scheme. And why in the heck do we have a president who not only tries to sell us on a product, but forces us to buy it and penalizes us if we don't? Precisely because the product is good, I want the cash registers to work. I want the, ch the checkout lines to be smooth. So I want people to be able to get this great product. Who is this guy? I don't know, but he seemed like a nice old man. Nice old man. No, this right here is David Rockefeller. This guy right here, you need to do some research on David Rockefeller. Feel free to do that whenever you get a chance. But people who know about this man right here, they know he is nothing but trouble. Rockefellers, come back. We don't want your new world order, you know? Uh -huh. Leave Chile right now. Leave Chile. You are not... You're, you're killing a lot of people! You're killing a lot of people! Leave here! Leave Chile right now! Leave Chile! Leave Chile! We don't want your world government! Leave Chile right now! Leave Chile, okay? Leave Chile! Your family! Your family is the most disgusting in the world, you know? Leave here! Leave! Leave! You also, you're a traitor to Chile! Mr. Agustin Edward, you're a traitor to Chile, okay? You're a traitor to Chile! What you're doing right now, okay? 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 You know everything! You know everything! You're participating with him! You're participating with him in this! Your world government will fail, okay? You heard what the man said. Leave Chile. Why was that man so mad at him? You want to know why? Because he knows the Rockefeller family is for the New World Order agenda. What is the New World Order agenda? Well, that is the plan of this secretive elite, this cabal, to bring about a one world government. And not only a one world government, but a one world currency. And not only a one world currency, but a one world religion to glue it all together. Which would mean they would have total control. The small amount of people controlling the whole world has never happened before. What else is going on? Well, depopulation. These guys push for depopulation in third world countries. You can see here, Henry Kissinger. Depopulation should be the highest priority of U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. So what they're doing is systematically killing off large populations of third world countries. And they're working to bring America to third world country status. They control the banks. They control the money. They will do it. That is their plan. And eventually they want to have the population down to an amount where they can control all the people. But you know what? You don't even have to take my word for it. Uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family. And he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney. And uh, we became friends. We started talking about things. And um, 
I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country, but yet at the same time we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one-world government where everybody has an, R R an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, any time you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do. What everything. You everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one-world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. And if you look here, he even tells you this is what he is about. Some people believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. That's David Rockefeller telling you he wants this New World Order. Well, he didn't say New World Order. Oh, oh, so you need him to say New World Order. Okay. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the New World Order. See that? That's why you got to pay attention. But before we break it down, I want you to see this. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the website. Number 322? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? A secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. We had a worldview. Republican and Democratic presidents alike, from Harry Truman to George Bush, stood for freedom and stood for certain propositions that would make America strong and healthy and grow the middle class and shrink poverty and stand against communism. And after 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders.
the affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. If you go outside the city of Atlanta, go east about 60 or 70 miles to the town of Elberton, and then go north on Highway 77 about 10 miles, you'll find off to the right what's called the Georgia Guidestones. It looks kind of like Stonehenge, these big, huge granite rocks set up there. This was done by a guy, we have a pseudonym, came in, paid cash, had this company set these things up in 1980. He called himself R.C. Christian, uh, but that's not his real name. It says it right on the stones, a pseudonym, false name. On these Georgia Guidestones, it gives the Ten Commandments for the New World Order. Ten Commandments for the New World Order. The, fir the first commandment was to maintain humanity under a half billion. I went there and looked at those things and said, now, hold on a minute. Today's population is six billion. They want to maintain humanity under one half billion. Looks like a lot of people got to die for their plan to work, which is, by the way, the plan... As Jacques Cousteau said, we'd have to eliminate 350,000 people a day. A third of a million people a day would have to be eliminated to save Mother Earth. Uh, Bill Clinton said we need to reduce the population of the Earth to one billion. There are a lot of folks who would like to reduce the population of the Earth. The Bible command is quite the opposite. America's place in the new world order should be. It's always been seen as the global policeman. But as you said before, you know, it's hard to see with all these military conflicts where the winner and loser lies. What, what should America be doing? I think globally? the global policeman should be the United Nations. And I don't think we should need one. I think we should uh, abuse courts uh, the way we do in, in civilian, uh, civilian life. It, 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 it's time to put war and conflict uh, armed conflict behind us and, and move on and start acting like civilized, educated human beings. Oh, you're so civilized, Ted. Let's look at your quote. A total population of 250 to 300 million people, a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. That's Ted Turner, founder of CNN and New World Order supporter. You see, he donated $1 billion to the United Nations. This man is down for the depopulation agenda. He wants a one-child policy for 100 years, yet he got five kids. And you got to pay attention because these jokers will tell you that they're selling out. And they do that just so it'll go over your head. So you'll be like, oh, well, they didn't really mean that. They're just being sarcastic. It's not that serious. But then at the same time, people be like, oh, well, I ain't going to believe that unless they tell me. He telling you right here. So we get Shaq admitting to the whole world that he's a Freemason and he is proud of it. What is, what is going on there? That's a ring of my profession. You don't know nothing about that. Okay, well, can we get a close-up on that? Yeah, yeah. What? You don't know nothing about that. What is the profession? Yeah, which profession are you talking man. about? Ooh, that man's so happy. Is it a legal profession? Of course it's legal. It's a ring of my profession. I'm trying to read it. Okay. Right, it's too many times. Ah! He's like, yep, I'm a Freemason. Ain't nothing you can do. Are you a Mason? Of course. And all them jokers okay. around him know what's going on. <laughs> That's a secret <laughs> ceremony. Well, you might as well put your pinky out when you drink your drink. Uh, wow. Put your pinky out. Are you involved in the secret <laughs> ceremonies? Stop it. Everyone wears it. Anyway, the Clippers. The Clippers. But that is impressive, Mr. O'Neill. I don't have a championship. Anyway, so the Clippers. Oh, yeah, I have four. Those he doesn't wear. Those he doesn't wear. The Clippers. Yeah, as I was blinded by success. Look at that man right there. That's impressive. I'm, I'm blinded by success. See, they know what the deal is when you're a Freemason. You know, they get all these movie roles and all these deals. Matter of fact, Shaq was on Grown Ups 2. It was one of the worst movies I have ever seen. Oh, my gosh. Terrible. Anyways, he on there. There go your boy Shaq. Shaq's a Freemason. Bring it right back to David Rockefeller. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. 
So they're going to bring out a problem and then they are going to offer a solution. One of their plans is to devalue the dollar so that it barely has any buying power. So then you go to the store, you can barely buy anything. You see the food on the shelf, but you can't afford it. What happens then? People start going crazy. People start to panic. Then people start robbing each other. People start killing each other. So then we need to bring in the police state. Oh, we're asking the government for help. And surely they are here to bring the order out of chaos, but it's not just any order. It is the new world order. And not only that, but they're going to bring about a one world currency to replace the old currency. And then they're going to bring it into a cashless society where you got to get the chip. All your money being on the chip. And also to glue it all together, the one world religion. Where these sellouts come to play, they are new world order compliant. They are here to sell you the agenda. They're going to let you know how cool it is to get a microchip in your arm. Some of y'all might think it's cool, but I know a lot of y'all don't like this type of stuff. So I'm just making sure you are aware of their agenda. But anyway, I've had people calling me saying they go out to their mailbox and they find a little red dot or a little blue dot on their mailbox and they wonder what the little red dot and blue dot is. Well, it's marking your mailbox by the government so when foreign troops come in here on us after martial law, if you have a red dot on your mailbox, they take you out immediately and shoot you right in the head. But if you have a blue dot, they take you to the FEMA camps being built by Halliburton right now to house 50 million Americans. They're building enough concentration camps in America by Halliburton that Cheney's getting rich off of, Vice President Cheney's getting rich off of, to put those...
comes with the blue dot on your mailbox in those concentration camps. Now, if you go out and you find a pink dot on your mailbox, that means that they believe you'll be a good slave and you're going to go along with the program and serve our international Antichrist masters. So watch for that dot. Listen to this, folks. I was pulled to the side road, which was uh, uh, a new cut gravel dirt road in front of a business, a builder supply business. And the right side of the road was filled with, uh, which I thought was portable toilets. To, I never looked at them that close. Same in color, maybe black, but which was an odd color. And I asked him about the, the field of black boxes. What, what were they? Because uh, I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, and his statement was that if he told me, I would be one of few people in Madison, Georgia, that knew about them. And he says they're, they're uh, disposable coffins, I believe he told me. And he says uh, there's a hundred, at that time, he said there was 125,000 there. And the brother of the man that owns this field, that the government is leasing this field from, to store these disposable coffins, this brother has been was given three years to set up temporary morgues around the country. Have you heard that the Department of Homeland Security has purchased 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition last year? I mean, that's going to cost millions and millions of dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this country broke? I mean, you turn on the TV, you hear how we're laying off air traffic controllers, how people are going to die because of it. I mean, Harrison Ford is in a tizzy, and we're spending this much money on bullets? Do you know that 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition is enough to fight a 20-year war and still have bullets left over? My question is, who is the Department of Homeland Security planning to shoot? Do you realize that over the past couple of months, our government has tried to pass bills through Congress allowing them to arrest American citizens without due process? allowing them to kill American citizens without due process. And uh, it's got the five regions for the FEMA camps, and it talks about barricades and barbed wire and, 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 and armed guards, and uh, it, it says that they've built the camps and that now they need to get ready to staff them and that they need to be ready within a 72-hour period. And so I want to challenge everybody to call their friends and their families now and realize that the new economy is to put tens of millions of people we already have the biggest prison population in the world in in this in this archipelago this 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 giant chain of facilities all over the country the following video details the contents of a department of defense document entitled internment and resettlement operations also known as fm 3-39.40 the document is 325 pages long and it is signed by Joyce E. Morrow, Administrative Assistant to the Secretary of the Army. It was created in 2010, however, it has just been recently leaked to the public via the internet and can now be downloaded from multiple sources. In the description below, you'll find a download link for the document. I strongly encourage you to download it yourself and to verify everything that's being said here. The document outlines military procedures for internment and resettlement of civilians, and it describes the layout and the administration of these internment camps. It clearly states on page 38 that it applies within U.S. territory, and it specifically addresses the detainment of U.S. citizens, as is indicated by the identification procedures for new prisoners on page 146, which states that social security numbers are to be recorded alongside their photograph and fingerprints. Included in the list of organizations which may be involved in these internment operations are the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Department of Defense, and the United Nations. On page 56, the document outlines the responsibilities of psychological operations officers within the camps, among which it states that a PSYOP officer develops and executes 
indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes and identifies political activists. On page 281, the document goes into more detail regarding the role of psychological operations within the camp, specifically in regards to pacifying the population and ensuring cooperation. On page 238, it gives the conditions for the use of deadly force in such camps. Among the justifications for lethal force, it includes to terminate an active escape attempt. That point right there should make it clear that these camps are not benevolent disaster relief type facilities. On page 244, the document calls for the use of snipers during riots to quote, scan a crowd and identify agitators and riot leaders for apprehension and fire lethal rounds if warranted. On page 260, it shows the basic layout for a facility focusing on detainment. It is depicted with interrogation areas, tribunal areas, and mortuaries. Each detainment facility is designed to hold 4,000 prisoners, and they are depicted with multiple levels of barbed wire separating compartments within the facilities, with a double barbed wire fence enclosing them, and watched over by 24 guard towers. On page 261, the document depicts the layout for what they call civilian resettlement facilities, which are designed to house 8,000 people. Though it uses the word resettlement, the plans show multiple levels of barbed wire dividing the sections of the facility, with double barbed wire fencing on the outside, as well as 16 guard towers. On page 262, the layout for facilities designed for what they call non-compliant prisoners is shown. These camps are designed to hold up to 300 prisoners, they have three interrogation centers, and are guarded by 13 guard towers. Now, if there's any question whether these plans are active or just theoretical, this should be settled by the fact that the U.S. Army has been running ads for job positions in these camps since 2009, and apparently, they're still hiring. Once again, if you look in the description, you'll find all the links you need to verify this information. It's important to note here that this document was created in 2010, which was under the Obama administration, and it predates the NDAA of 2012, which authorized military detainment of U.S. citizens. This clearly shows a long-term agenda at work. saying he's a military police and he says we've been sent footage before by military police and others so i want this footage of them in briefings openly talking about gun confiscations now that's now in the manuals that they're training to quarantine cities and towns and confiscate guns we've had navy seals on confirming it we have the documents we know that but footage not just in some army manual but footage could really really hurt uh, the folks that are uh, trying to covertly prepare the military for basically civil war. Brian, uh, obviously, uh, you've got to go back in right now. Tell us as much as you can and how we get this footage, but describe it for us. Okay, so I was in a briefing with uh, FEMA. FEMA runs my old unit. I'm actually out now. I got out in September of this year. Uh, they were talking about suspension of the Constitution, Second and Fourth Amendment rights being taken away, and I openly asked them, uh, are we going to take guns? He says no, but he says they will. It's clearly on the video. They will. Talking about the FEMA guys with us. Um, so that's the gist of the video. You could, uh, I'm filming the floor because it kind of startled me when they said that they're going to suspend the Constitution under martial law, which is pretty scary to me. Essentially, yeah, we pretty much at that time, you're... So you said that uh, martial law suspends their Second Amendment. So would, I'm not going to, but would you say we would take weapons from people? Yeah, that's what they do. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Prolonged detention. Did you ever see the movie Minority Report? It was based on a Philip K. Dick short story. It came out in 2002. It starred Tom Cruise, remember? He played a police officer in something called the Department of Pre-Crime. Pre-Crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Mr. Marks. My mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubinos. Take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours, 4 minutes. No, I didn't do anything. You didn't do anything, but you're gonna. 
future murder. Creepy, right? Putting somebody in jail, not for what they've done, but for what you're very sure they're going to do? There may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes. In some cases, because evidence may be tainted. But who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. We're not prosecuting them for past crimes, but we need to keep them in prison because of our expectation of their future crimes. Al Qaeda terrorists and their affiliates are at war with the United States, and those that we capture, like other prisoners of war, must be prevented from attacking us again. Prevented. We will incarcerate people preventively. Preventive incarceration. Indefinite detention without trial. That's what, that's what this is. That's what President Obama proposed today. If you strip away the euphemisms. One civil liberties advocate told the New York Times today, quote, we've known this was on the horizon for many years, but we were able to hold it off with George Bush. The idea that we might find ourselves fighting with the Obama administration over these powers is really stunning. And it is stunning. As a psychiatrist, I remember very well the condemnation by the American Psychiatric Association of Soviet psychiatrists and the Soviet Union for their use of psychiatric techniques and psychiatric medications to control political dissidents. Sadly, shockingly, we in the United States have become those same oppressors. We now have a policy as exemplified by the FBI brochure from the Phoenix Office on Counterterrorism, which says people who are defenders of the U.S. Constitution against federal government and the U.N. and make numerous references to the U.S. Constitution should be monitored as potentially murderous and fanatical terrorists, by extension, should be considered mentally unstable. Department of Justice memo, which tells local police what should you be looking out for in kind of everyday terrorism prevention and terrorism watch uh, um, activities. And one of the things that is considered a potential terrorist risk is individuals who harbor doubts about the official story regarding 9-11. The memo adds 9-11 official story skeptics to the growing list of targets. Know good and well that someday there could be a government in power that is shipping its citizens off for disagreements. There are laws on the books now that characterize who might be a terrorist. Someone missing fingers on their hands is a suspect according to the Department of Justice. Someone who has guns, someone who has ammunition, Someone who has more than seven days of food in their house. Can be considered a potential terrorist. If you are suspected by these activities, do you want to have the government have the ability to send you to Guantanamo Bay for indefinite detention? A suspect. We're not talking about someone who has been tried and found guilty. We're talking about someone suspected of activity. President Obama is now allowed to write in laws without consent from Congress, making us no different than a dictatorship. The president has just signed many executive orders that allows the government to take your assets, your loans, your children, transportation, and gives the government permission to put you into concentration camps and labor camps. If you do not believe me, here are the executive orders. Read them yourself. Here we go. Executive Order 10990 allows the government to take over all modes of transportation and control of all highways and seaports. 
Executive Order 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. Executive Order 10997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 10998 allows the government to seize all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks, or vehicles of any kind, and total control over highways, seaports, and waterways. Executive Order 10999 allows the government to take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order 11000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. Executive Order 11001 allows the government to take over all health, education, and welfare functions. Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Executive Order 11003 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft including commercial aircraft. Executive Order 11004 allows a housing and finance authority to relocate communities, build new housing with public funds, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Executive Order 11005 allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11051 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of increased international tensions and economic or financial crisis. Executive Order 11310 grants authority to the Department of Justice to enforce the plan set out in executive orders to institute industrial support, to establish judicial and legislative liaison, to control all aliens, to operate penal and correctional institutions, and to advise and assist the President. Executive Order 11049 assigns emergency preparedness function to federal department and agencies, consolidating 21 operative executive orders issued over a 15-year period. Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over the mechanisms of production and distribution of energy sources, wages, salaries, credit, and the flow of money in U.S. financial institution in any undefined national emergency. It also provides that when a state of emergency is declared by the President, Congress cannot review the action for six months. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has broad powers in every aspect of the nation. General Frank Salzito, Chief of FEMA's Civil Security Division, stated in a 1983 conference that he saw FEMA's role as a new frontier in the protection of individual and governmental leaders from assassination and of civil and military installations from sabotage and or attack as well as prevention of dissident groups from gaining access to U.S. opinion or a global audience in times of crisis. FEMA's powers were consolidated by President Carter to incorporate the National Security Act 1947 that allows for strategic relocation of industries, services, government, and other essential economic activities and to rationalize the requirements for manpower, resources, and production facilities. The 1950 Defense Production Act gives the President sweeping powers over all aspects of the economy. The Act of August 29, 1916 authorizes the security of the Army in time of war to take possession of any transportation system from transporting troops, material, or any other purpose related to the emergency. The International Emergency Economic Powers Act enables the President to seize the property of a foreign country or national. These powers were transferred to FEMA in a sweeping consolidation in 1979. Did Hitler get elected on Monday and start throwing people into ovens on Friday? No, it was a gradual process. The first thing that Hitler did was start to write newspaper articles. Every, everything that was going wrong was the Jews' fault. 
They're the ones that caused all these problems. Did the Jews write their own newspaper articles and go, I disagree? So then the Jews had to wear the Star of David so we can tell who you are. Did they say, no, that's a violation of my property, privacy. I don't have to tell you. No. The Jews decided, well, it's a religious symbol. We love God. We should be proud to wear the Star of David. Eventually, the, Jew, the Germans came in and they broke all of the windows in all of the Jewish businesses in one weekend. The, the Saturday night was known as Kristallnacht, which is German for night of glass. Did the Jews rise up and say, now, damn it, you're violating my property. You shouldn't do that. No. Gosh, we don't want to make the Germans any madder than they already are. Don't piss them off. They've got guns. Eventually, the Germans are loading them up in the cattle trailers, in the, on the train. Where do you think you're going? On vacation? Where do you think they're going to take you? Well, now you're cold and naked and they're walking you into the ovens where you're going to go to mass execution. Is it time now to raise your hand and say, you know, I tend to disagree with all of this. Bang! You're dead. It's too late to complain. You should have complained at the beginning, when you at least had a chance. How bad do things have to get before you do something? Do they have to take away all your property? Do they have to license every activity that you want to engage in? Do they have to be throwing you on cattle cars before you start to say, now wait a minute, I don't think this is a good idea. How long is it going to be before you finally resist?
by the way. We have a new channel called Anarchy World. Type it in as one word in the YouTube search bar to find the new channel. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to share, like, favorite, subscribe to Anarchy World and most importantly re-upload this video to your YouTube channel to help maximize the exposure of this video. You may re-upload this video to your YouTube channel. First you must go to your browser add-on feature. Download YouTube Downloader to your browser. Come back to this YouTube video and you should see a download button if you did it correctly. When you see it, click download, download it then upload it your YouTube channel. Uploading it will get the video out there much better than sharing will. Here are the people responsible.